<laughs> I'm turning on Star Wars again. No! This episode is sponsored by Hired.com. Every week on Hired, they run an auction where over a thousand tech companies in San Francisco, New York, and LA bid on JavaScript developers, providing them with the salary and equity up front. The average JavaScript developer gets an average of 5 to 15 introductory offers and an average salary of over $130,000 a year. Users can either accept an offer and go right into interviewing with the company or deny them without any continuing obligations. It's totally free for users, and when you're hired, they also give you a $2,000 signing bonus as a thank you for using them. But if you use the Adventures in Angular link, you'll get a $4,000 bonus instead. Finally, if you're not looking for a job but know someone who is, you can refer them to Hire to get a $1,337 bonus if they accept a job. Go sign up at Hire.com slash Adventures in Angular. Ready to master Angular? Oasis Digital offers Angular Bootcamp, a three-day in-person workshop class for individuals or teams. Bring us to your site or send developers to our classes in St. Louis or San Francisco, angularbootcamp.com. This episode is sponsored by DigitalOcean. DigitalOcean is the provider I use to host all of my creations. All the shows are hosted there, along with any other projects I come up with. Their user interface is simple and easy to use, their support is excellent, and their VPSs are backed on solid state drives and are fast and responsive. Check them out at digitalocean.com. If you use the code Angular Adventures, you'll get a $10 credit. This episode is sponsored by Telerik, the makers of Kendo UI. Kendo UI integrates seamlessly with both AngularJS 1.x and 2.0. It provides everything you need to integrate with AngularJS out of the box, bindings, component configuration directives, template directives, form validation event handlers, and much more. And yet, Kendo UI tooling does not depend on AngularJS, so if you want to use it with Angular or not, that's totally up to you. You can check it out at kendoui.com. Hey, everybody, and welcome to episode 76 of the Adventures in Angular show. This week on our panel, we have Joe Eames. May the force be with you. Oh, please. Ward Bell. Yeah, anything but the force. John Papa. Chewy, we're home. <laughs> Lucas Rulke. Hello. I'm Charles Maxwood from devchat.tv. It is too late to get tickets for JS Remote Conf, but we are doing freelance remote conf next month, so go check it out. Uh, we have a special guest this week, and that is Andrew Connell. Hello, it's great to see Han Solo flying again. Oh, brother. <laughs> this show is over. <laughs> <laughs> uh, what, what's the Star Wars metaphor for Jump the Shark? <laughs> Punch uh, it, Chewie. Oh, that's right in there. Uh-oh. Do you, do you want to introduce yourself, Andrew? Sure. Um, I guess thanks for having me. I, uh, Andrew Connell, I'm a longtime, I guess, uh, traditionally a Microsoft developer that has made the switch over in the last few years to doing a lot more JavaScript stuff. I host a podcast uh, for the Microsoft Cloud Show and uh, do a lot of do a lot of work primarily with the Office and Azure groups, uh, specifically building web apps for Office 365, SharePoint applications like that. Nice. So uh, how does that all figure in with Angular? <laughs> so uh, I guess the last few years, like I said, I, I share a similar background to uh, what a lot of the guys, uh, what a lot of you um, have. I think Joe and John and, and Ward, where I'm traditionally a, a Microsoft server-side developer, did ASP.NET, building web apps and all that kind of stuff. Um, but then the last few years have shifted away from that, um, doing more stuff just web-based applications, um, using things, started out with like Durandal and now spending a lot more time um, with Angular. And what I've been seeing, at least for the last year or so, is Microsoft is really embracing, specifically the Office division, is doing a lot of work to embrace this more open source and Angular-based development um, or web app-based development uh, for building applications on their platforms. Can you contrast that for a second to what it has traditionally been like to build for an Office pro- uh, platform and, and and where they're going, what's happened? Sure. So I guess my, my original background is back from like the one product that everyone in the world seems to hate, which is SharePoint, which has been actually kind of nice because the few of us that did it, nobody else wanted to do it. It actually came with good billing rates. But um, <laughs> nice. what we did with SharePoint is that uh, for... Oh, the longest time we would build server side based things. So building a DLL with C sharp and everything and then having some sort of a deployment model to inject it into SharePoint and have SharePoint run it on our behalf. Uh, we went from that model, which I'd say is 2007 all the way up to like say 2010 to start moving things out of, um, the SharePoint process and trying to have SharePoint instead calling our external applications. And so we did that 
primarily using server side code that give us like some sandbox process, but we would still be writing using C sharp or VB to write DLLs, hand them over to, to a sandboxed process. Um, that would execute it so that if our stuff blew up, it wouldn't affect SharePoint. But in the last few years, what Microsoft has really been trying to do is to get more in this services business. And one of those services is uh, their their fastest growing product now in the history of the company, which is, is Office 365, which Office 365, for those who aren't familiar, it's Microsoft's hosted uh, software as a service offering for things like um, SharePoint, hosted Exchange, hosted uh, Skype, hosted uh, Yammer for social networking, and also their enterprise uh, file sharing product called uh, OneDrive for Business. And when they went to that direction, the challenge that they were going to have was like we all probably had you know, many, many years ago, which is when I wanted to write a, an application and run it on one of these shared hosting providers, they would never let me build like a com object. They never let me build something that would have to be installed because if I had a bug and my application went down, it would take down everybody else on the server or potentially take down everybody else on the server and affect other customers. So what they did is they tried to find a better option for still giving developers the ability to build customizations and either inject them or have the hosting application call it. They needed to have a way to an easier way to do this. And to do that with server side code that you gave to Microsoft and had them host for you was not the option. So they came up with two different ways of doing this. One was called, um, well, one general way is something called an add in. And this originally was called apps and they had to rename it. And now it's called add ins. And the, the gist of it is, is that instead of Microsoft hosting and running your code, you would host it somewhere. And then my SharePoint, for example, would call into your application or it would just simply redirect the user over to your application. And then you would talk back to Office 365 over HTTPS using RESTful services or this little client side API that was like a basically just a wrapper to their REST APIs, all authenticated over OAuth. To get to the Angular story, though, is that the, they gave us two ways of doing this. Um, these add-ins, we had one way of doing something called provider-hosted apps or add-ins, which was essentially building a server-side web application that was any technology, any infrastructure hosted anywhere. It could be a PHP app running in Heroku. And Microsoft would just essentially, when someone would, would say, I want to run that app, it would just redirect them over to that URL where that app ran. The other option, though, was something called a SharePoint hosted app. Now, it's actually got a really bad name because the concept of a SharePoint hosted app only meant that SharePoint hosted the assets and it would serve them up. But those assets were not run server side. They were all uh, served up and run in the client. So it was all CSS, HTML, JavaScript, images, stuff like that. So that's where Angular started to become a really appealing option because now developers didn't need to have a separate place to go long, to go deploy their application. They could still hand it to SharePoint or deploy it to SharePoint, but SharePoint wasn't executing the application. It was just serving up the files as like a file share and your application can run within the context of the SharePoint site that you're in. Angular made a great, was a, a great option for that because then you could build full blown client applications. So um, Andrew? And yeah. if I could interject, so I'm, I'm listening to you and it sounds cool. And I understand how some of this works, but I want to make sure we're clear to all the audience too. And when you take a SharePoint installation and you want to write some Angular code there, how do you host that code? I mean, it, Angular goes client side. It's got to be served up from some static server. And then it's got to be able to talk to some APIs, either client or server based. Can you explain how that integration works? You really have two options. Either one, you host it yourself. So you just tell SharePoint, you give SharePoint an XML file uh, when you install your app, which installing an app is just really just giving SharePoint an XML file. And all that really does is that just hands a, um, that just tells SharePoint that go over to this other web app, this other URL to go load the application, then you host it wherever. But the other option is, like I was saying before, and what you're asking is that if I want to give it to SharePoint, let them host it. You build this package. Um, Visual Studio has a way of building this package. It's just a zip file uh, with a special name. It includes that XML file, which is just a manifest telling SharePoint about the app. Things like the title, the version, what's the start page for it, and what permissions it needs. And then all the assets related to that application, like the JavaScript files, the HTML, the images, would all be inside of that application. When you would then give it to SharePoint and have SharePoint install it, it would put it inside of a special SharePoint site that every app install would get. So it would isolate your install from everybody else's app and isolate your install from um, the rest of the sites that you were installing it within so that a customer, I could deploy an application and a customer would feel safe that even if they installed Andrew's application, if it did some nefarious stuff, it could only do it within the context of that app and it couldn't access my enterprise data. Cool. So thank you. And so when that app's running, 
Can you give us some examples of some things that Angular is ideal for in this situation? I mean, why not just basic JavaScript, for example? It's a good question. I mean, you could build any kind of an application doing this. A lot of people, you, we, we originally started doing stuff with, like, say, um, Knockout or even building... It's kind of funny. We don't have, we didn't have names for stuff until we had a name for something. And then we had to give a name to the old stuff. So like we would, we could build multi page applications where we had, um, a bunch of different HTML files that we would just redirect them. They just jump from page to page that was still being hosted inside of SharePoint, but it was just HTML being served up. Um, Angular made a lot of sense because it gave people a much, it gave them a feel like they were building, they were working with a client installed application, which a lot of these enterprise users, we're much more familiar with. They weren't as so, right, and so you're not just talking about building like a text box with a button as an application. You're talking about building actual mini applications inside of here. Yeah, building a mini application like a learning manager, or building some sort of like an order management system, or building some sort of like a, a CRM interface type thing. I mean, it's usually it's they're they can get pretty big and pretty complex, but um, a lot of times companies want to have these applications when they're already invested in something like SharePoint or they're invested in something like Office 365, they want their applications to live inside of this environment, um, partially because all the users are already going to be there. They already have their logins. And so you don't have to worry about the authentication story. Everybody's already logged in. Everybody's taken care of. And it's also going to fit right in line with their corporate intranet or their corporate uh, departmental workspace or something like that so that it doesn't feel like you don't have this jarring kind of jump from one application to another one to be able to get some stuff accomplished. And you're also able to write applications that integrate with existing lists and things that are in SharePoint or, or documents that you have in Office 365. There's a whole, whole set of APIs that, that somebody who writes these applications can tie into to get a hold of corporate data, right? Isn't that sort of integration story part of what's what's being said here? Yes, absolutely. I mean, you could build an application that is completely self-standing and that just is kind of a one-off from your corporate deployment, your corporate SharePoint or your corporate intranet. However, let's say that you've got a site that's got a bunch of existing data in it, um, a bunch of lists, um, maybe some information from a conference of collecting leads. If you wanted to be able to create an application to be able to process those leads, your application can be given permissions to talk to other SharePoint sites. And then it would use the context of both that user and the application to be able to talk to those lists to show that data from within your Angular application. So you could build an application that doesn't store any data. Instead, it just uses the data that's already inside of SharePoint, be it list data, be it contacts, be it files, um, Word documents, all kinds of things. So like, for example, I built an application with, um, as it, well, an application that Dan Wallin had built about a uh, travel expense manager type application. He did it as an Angular app. We took that Angular application and we actually ported it to actually to store all this data. Instead of it storing it um, independently in its own repositories, we stored all the data inside of SharePoint. So we had an expense list. We had a uh, tracking list uh, for all the different employees. We used OneDrive for Business to store attachments for all of the um, expenses that people would scan in from their different receipts and stuff. But the Angular app was the thing that actually helped manage all the data. But the users still felt like they were still inside of SharePoint. So things were still nice and comfortable to the experience that they were already in. So I guess what I get is the, uh, you know, I get the single page app advantages that like everybody who's an Angular developer is listening on this podcast is familiar with. So that's what it's like from a developer's perspective who's outside of the whole SharePoint ecosystem per se. But what the business gets is rapid application development of these responsive single page apps and the sort of safety of their own environment and the interaction with the corporate assets that they already are care about and are maintaining. And that's kind of the union of, uh, of interest, right? I mean, it used to be yeah. really hard to write your own app that could do anything that also touched SharePoint and office assets, right? It was, I guess, hard is always in the eye of the beholder. I would say there was a, there was a steep learning curve because you had to have some domain knowledge of how SharePoint worked, how data was stored and all that kind of stuff. It's the same way of like, if you jumped over to Salesforce and you wanted to build an application that talked to Salesforce, you have to understand the relationships between leads and accounts and contacts and all that stuff. So yes, it does, it does make it a little bit easier for developers. I think it makes it easier for developers to be able to build stuff and to get it deployed with the added benefit that you don't have to worry about where you're going to host anything. Now, all of this stuff that, that I've talked about so far, all of this is what we call SharePoint add-ins. Um, but there's a whole nother add-in model that, um, we've seen, I've seen actually a really, a lot of interest around 
um, Angular developers who are not as familiar with the, the Microsoft space or even traditional just uh, Office-based stuff. And that's building add-ins for Office, like Office clients, like Word, Excel, Outlook, and stuff like that. You mean like extending their capabilities with my own kind of web application? Yeah. So essentially what you can yeah, do. Like why, it, why would I want to do that? What's the driving fact behind me wanting to extend Outlook, for example? Uh, it's a good question. So there's a lot of different scenarios you can look at. Let me just let me kind of call out a couple of the ones that are out there um, that people can can go grab and take a look at today that don't cost anything. So like, for example, let's think about the context of Outlook. You have two different each one with like an A and a B option, two different extensibility points. One for mail, and that's both the read form and the compose form, and then one for um, appointments or meetings, and that's, again, the read or the compose. Let's say, for example, that you get an email from uh, someone that you ordered a, a book from or ordered something from, like, say, Amazon, and it's got a tracking code in it. What do we all do? We either click on the link and we either go to UPS or 